We're going to move on from reproductive age women to menopause and uh, what we need to think about. I'm going to talk about the midlife menopause consultation, talk a little bit about epidemiolo epidemiology of menopause so that we can all educate our patients. And then we're going to talk about the WHI trial and this has really been a huge trial in terms of women's health in the Western world and we are still feeling the shockwaves and ramifications of this trial. Talk a little bit about what happened and what we're currently telling women in 2019. So this is why we need to think about menopause. Now if you look at this life expectancy data, the age of menopause <coughs> has not changed over the years. We would actually put that slightly higher, but nevertheless, age of menopause has stayed absolutely stable. But life expectancy has changed significantly. And women nowadays can very reasonably expect to live a third of their life in their postmenopausal years. And I think it behoves us as health professionals to help women plan for those years and to make them healthy quality of life years. This is why we're thinking about it. What do I want you thinking about in this menopausal consultation? I want you thinking about three things. If you say to that woman when she turns up with some slightly irregular periods, what do you think is going to kill you, the studies show that she's most likely to answer breast cancer. But actually, in fact, that's not the truth. So if you look at the statistics from New Zealand data in 2009, breast cancer deaths were about half what heart disease deaths were. And if you look at this New England medical study looking at the chance of dying over the next 10 years with breast cancer compared to death from any other cause, actually breast cancer is not the most, the most highest chance of, that, of killing that woman. It is in, in fact heart disease. So the first thing we should be thinking about is that woman's risk of heart disease. And you all know how to do that. I'd be interested though we're supposed to have a predict the Rod Jackson software out there. Is that starting to filter into general practice yet? Yeah? So Rod Jackson's data giving us some local predictors of cardiac risk uh, instead of the Framingham scores and so on is probably extremely helpful. Then we need to think about breast cancer risk. And this paper back in 2003 is very interesting. What it suggests is if we had the ability to get hold of all women at menopause, make them all non-smokers, give them all a normal BMI, stop all the alcohol, and get all women exercising, we would eliminate a third of breast cancers in the postmenopausal years. And I think that that third is very interesting when you look at what I'm talking about in terms of breast cancer risk from HRT and worth keeping in mind. And then finally, education. I hear again and again from all women in their 40s and 50s, nobody talks about menopause. I don't really know what to expect. I don't understand what's coming. And I think we're in a very good position to be educating women about the kind of data that is the slide after this. So absolutely women can help themselves and a lot of what I've just listed to you is also what we should be educating women about. Identifying triggers for flushes and sweats, there's a bit of data looking at CBT and mindfulness, thinking about mood and regular health screening, all of which are really important. So this data is from the SWAN study, which is an American epidemiological study of women's midlife health. It's an ongoing study. And it showed that women tend to fall into one of these four groups with menopausal symptoms. It all sits around the last menstrual period and years before the last menstrual period and years after the last menstrual period. And the chance of having vasomotor symptoms is what's been looked at. And you will see about 20% of women fall into this group here where they don't actually have very many symptoms and life moves on and periods stop. 
So therefore about 80% of women will be symptomatic and about 50% of women will find their symptoms affect quality of life enough that they will knock on our door and ask for help. About 20% of women fall into the group that the Americans call their super flashes. And these women, these are the ones that say HRT didn't work for me because it saved up all my menopause and then it occurred when HRT stopped. And actually what HRT has done for those women is give them some quality of life while they were taking it and they continue to flush. Probably the vast majority of women we see fall into this group here, so not really very, no symptoms at all while periods are regular, starting to become a little bit symptomatic as cycles change and then the chance of becoming symptomatic peaks in the two to three years after menopause. The average duration of symptoms for this group is about seven and a half years past the last menstrual period. So you're in for the long haul with these patients. And when you come here, out to 14 years after the last menstrual period, there's about 20% of women that are still symptomatic. But I think the message is that for those women, symptoms are very likely to resolve with time. And I, I, use that, I use that graph with my patients because I think it's quite useful for women to understand why they don't feel the same as, the, as their friend down at the golf club and also the long duration of symptoms. And these are the kind of symptoms we're talking about. And clearly the symptomatology will change as women th move through the menopausal transition. So the symptoms to begin with is often breast tenderness as estrogen levels go up, irregular bleeding, very commonly very heavy dysfunctional bleeding, headaches. Then the flushes and sweats can start. Arthralgias is very common and probably under-recognised and mood change. And then as women move out the other side of the menopausal transition, vaginal dryness will be about the most common symptom that women experience. And I want to highlight two symptoms to you as something that I want you all to be thinking about. The first is mood. I think we're all very good at recognizing the postpartum period as a time for mood vulnerability for women but I want you all to be starting to think about the early menopausal transition as a time for mood vulnerability as well. And this data from Pauline Mackey published last year suggested that if you had a major depressive episode in the past, you have a 50% chance of a major depressive episode as you move through menopause. But if you've never had a mood issue in the past, you still have a 25% chance of a major depressive episode as you move through the menopausal transition. But what actually is most common is as you ask your questions around mood, women will have depressive traits. They may not tick every box, but actually in fact they're ticking a few boxes. And talking to women about this will help stop that statement of, I think I'm just going mad, because it's increasingly recognised. And the other is don't forget about vaginas because they're also really important and this is the menopausal symptom that will get worse rather than better with time and is so easily treated. So here's the histology of somebody in their 30s with a four weekly menstrual cycle and here's somebody 10 years after menopause with no estrogen. And you can see why this becomes so friable when it sits around the urethra, it gives urinary frequency and urgency and urinary tract infections. And many women won't really talk about these symptoms, but they are out there and you need to proactively ask. It will worsen with age and it's very, very easily treated. Vaginal moisturizers, lubricants, but vaginal estrogen is a very safe medication to give. It doesn't increase your risk of anything. The only concern is the aromatase inhibitor group for women who have breast cancer, which has some controversy and some oncologists give and some do not and is always worth a multidisciplinary discussion. But for all other women, this does not increase your thrombosis risk, it does not increase your chance of endometrial carcinoma and it should be offered and used. Okay, so this was the big trial Women's Health Initiative trial, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with the details of, was planned in the early 90s. 
and it was planned to understand the effect of HRT on chronic disease prevention for women who were a large distance from the menopausal transition. And that was the aim of the trial. But in 2002, this is how the first arm of the trial was presented to the media. So the statement that was made was, this is stopped early because of the combined estrogen and progesterone in healthy menopausal women due to an increased risk of invasive breast cancer, increases coronary heart disease, and on balance, harm was greater than benefit. This information hit the media gallery 10 days before this the, the paper was available to medical people to be able to have a look at it and analyse it. And these were the kind of headlines that the media picked up on. And millions of women stopped their HRT. So how did we end up here and what does it all mean? Well. The average age of women in this trial was 63, and most of them were over 10 years since the menopausal transition. 50% <clears throat> were smokers, 50% were overweight, and 30% either had had a myocardial infarction or had active angina. So they're not reflective of the group of women that we currently treat for menopausal symptoms. A quarter of women were not, had used HRT in the past, so only 75% of the women studied were HIT naive. And I'm going to show you in the next, uh, next slide the importance, why that was important. The study only looked at conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate, but in fact the results of this trial have been generalised to all hormone replacement therapy. It's also very interesting, there was a clear conflict regarding the investigators after the initial paper was published. It was actually written by a secret squirrel group of, of, of the investigators, and when you read some of the papers that have come out since, there was clear disagreement from a large number of the investigator group. And the results were sensationalised, they were overgeneralised, and further information, the women who used estrogen-only HRT, who had had a hysterectomy, and further information about the younger group of women were not picked up by the media, and we didn't get those re that information out there to the lay public. This also is, so this is all about the women who were HRT naive. So this is about breast cancer diagnosis, and this information here was what was published in the initial 2002 paper. So this is combined HRT in women who had not had a hysterectomy, and the blue line is the estrogen and progesterone use for that woman, those women, and the red line is the placebo group, and this is the number of breast cancers that were diagnosed in those groups of women. When you remove the quarter of women that had used HRT in the past, this is what the graph looks like. And the statistical significance is lost. And for a long time there was this thought out there that you can use HRT for five years that is safe, but more than five years it is not safe and we must stop the HRT. But actually this graph makes that five year cutoff meaningless because in fact actually the large number of women had used a lot of HRT before they actually started in the trial. In addition to this, this is a particularly low rate of breast cancer diagnosis. It's not supported by other studies. And there's lots of hypothesis around as to why that might have been particularly low, including the use of HRT previously. But we can't really prove that. And as you're aware, women who use HRT tend to be from different socioeconomic levels, different education backgrounds, and it's impossible to draw any sort of conclusion. So what happened after WHI? Well, this was significant, the implications of this. The prescriptions for hormone replacement therapy fell dramatically. 
So the SWAN trial I showed you went from about 9% of women prescribed HRT prior to 2002 to about 3% after 2002. Women were muddled and scared, and I think many women out there are still muddled and scared by the information that we are, sh we are giving them. And we lost many of our funded regimes for HRT uh, after that time. But the prescriptions for SSRIs soared, and the bioidentical hormone industry, which hopefully we'll have time to talk about at the end, also benefited significantly from this from a financial viewpoint. And as well as that, we started to lose menopausal education for health professionals. And I think that there is some uncertainty around prescribing HRT out there. But also there's this. So this is a health provider in Southern California that, that is involved with about 80,000 women. And this is 2002 to 2008. The line with the squares is the HRT prescribing over this time. So you can see that the HRT prescribing drops off quite significantly. And here's the hip fracture rate of those women over that time. So you don't really have much chance of having a hip fracture compared in the two groups on HRT, off HRT, one year after stopping. But actually, after five years after stopping HRT, hip fractures go significantly higher. I think that's going to be one of the implications of all of this over the next few years. And so this led Joanne Manson, who was the lead author of the initial WHI trial, to make this statement, that actually we're not worried about the over-prescribing of <coughs> HRT to prevent chronic conditions but we're worried about the underutilization of hormone replacement therapy to treat symptomatic women for their, with their menopausal symptoms. And the North American Menopause Society published what we are currently using for indications for HRT use. So in women under the age of 60, or less than 10 years since the menopausal transition, we should be offering HRT as first-line treatment to treat menopausal symptoms. It's very good treatment to treat vulvovaginal atrophy and also should be thought about in the setting of lowered bone density uh, for this group of women. And the change all sits around the timing hypothesis. So when you're close to menopause, your coronary arteries look like this, generally. They're clear, they don't have atherosclerosis. But as time goes on, they start to develop plaque. And estrogen disrupts that plaque. That's why starting somebody at 65, 15 years since the menopausal transition never used any HRT, probably does push that woman's risk of a cardiac event or a stroke up a little bit but probably doesn't change that woman's risk of a cardiac event or stroke when they're 50 and quite close to the menopausal transition. And the timing hypothesis was tested with the ELITE trial. This took women much closer to the menopausal transition and split them into two groups. So less than six years since the menopausal transition and 10 years after the menopausal transition. And overall, they were a younger group of women than WHI. They used estradiol, so a slightly different estrogen, and a vaginal progestogen, progesterone gel, and measured carotid intimal medial thickness as a surrogate marker for heart disease. And the purple line is the important line. So these are the women that are less than six years since the menopausal transition using estrogen and vaginal progesterone gel compared to the red dotted line which are the placebo group of women, so the early menopausal transition taking a placebo. And there is a significant difference between these women. This is the older women after 10 years after the menopausal transition, and their cardiac risk is higher. So this, the conclusion to this trial is that if you use HRT early on in the menopausal transition, you are not increasing women's risk of a cardiac event, and you may be modifying it a little bit. There is the KEEPS trial afterwards that showed no significant difference in this group. So I don't think that you can say that we are improving cardiac outcomes, but I think you can say we are not increasing women's risk. 
And then finally, two years ago, the WHI long-term follow-up was published, and these were the results. So this is 18 years of follow-up, and they managed to get a large number of women. They followed up almost every woman in the trial. And all-cause mortality was no different between the treatment groups and the placebo groups. Slightly higher chance of breast cancer, it's, it's not reaching statistical significance. The women who were on combined HRT with regards to breast cancer mortality and less breast cancer mortality in the estrogen only hormone replacement therapy group. And this was the conclusion to the long term follow up trial that five and a half years, get it right, five and a half years of combined HRT or seven years of estrogen only was not associated with any increased total cardiovascular or cancer mortality. So what did we learn? What was, it, what was its use? I think WHI has shown us that risk is an age-related phenomenon. And so the, what, what I think in my head, just thinking about the POI talk this morning and me saying to you that every woman under the age of 40 should be offered estrogen for the reasons we talked about, I think about it like this. So between the age of 40 and 45, if women go through menopause, I'm very keen on using some estrogen for them to protect their bone density and probably to protect their heart. Between 45 and 50, I talk to women about estrogen, look at their bone density, and we have a discussion around it. And after 50 to 60, if those indications sit there, menopausal symptoms that are affecting quality of life or lowered bone density, then HRT is first line treatment for those women. And risk benefit ratio needs to be individualized and thought about. And that depends on your baseline disease risk, heart disease risk, age at menopause, years since the menopause transition. Stella's going to talk, I hope, about types of HRT and routes used. Uh, and we need to be continually assessing those women for risk. So with time, bringing doses down a little bit. But this is going to be there for the long haul and there's no absolute rush with that. So what risk are we telling women? So the risk is different for women on estrogen only HRT and estrogen versus progesterone. For the women who are using estrogen only HRT, they're not increasing their risk of breast cancer and they're not increasing their risk of, breast, of, of heart disease. They have a slightly higher risk of clot in the legs and the lungs and transdermal estrogen is probably, is, is almost certainly a little bit safer, but the difference in absolute numbers of risk is probably small and no increased risk of stroke. Now the breast cancer risk for combined HRT is tricky because, um, because it's very age dependent and the studies are variable. But at the moment we're quoting quite a conservative risk. So what, what I say is if women are in their late 50s, then they have one per 1200 women per year chance of breast cancer attributable to their HRT. And my comment of the late 50s really sits with if somebody goes through menopause at 45 and starts HRT, their risk probably doesn't kick in until about 50. And if we believe the WHI data and believe that that risk is attributable to the group of women that we currently treat, they've got at least five years, they've probably got six or seven years, and so I tend to talk about the slightly vague late 50s. But what I do say too is that that risk of one per 1,200 women is the same risk as if women choose to have two alcoholic drinks a day or if they're overweight. And so sometimes women can choose to modify other risk factors and continue to use their hormones. So heart disease risk is likely to be your patient's biggest killer and we need to think about uh, their heart disease risk and how much that's going to, how much we can modify that over the next few years. Please, please think about mood, anxiety, low mood. It's really important for your patient's quality of life and think about vulvovaginal atrophy. 
HRT is the first line treatment for almost all women we are seeing with menopausal symptoms now and much more effective than SSRIs. And discussing breast cancer risk with women is really important because that's where the fear sits in most women uh, that we're having these conversations with. And risk is an age dependent phenomenon. So continuing to see your patient and think about risk and think about doses is really important.